It's May 4th, wasn't it, Jamie? Lock it in, folks, for people travelling and that have made their way up here, then it's probably a good excuse to make your way back next year, I reckon. Um, okay, on to our next one. Um, we're gonna, Fiona's going to do a presentation now about the seagrass monitoring that takes place in Roebuck Bay. And, and people keep talking about the mud flats and the seagrass, and I'd encourage anyone that hasn't done it to go for a walk out there at low tide because it's one of the most peaceful and, I don't know, serene things you can do with watching all the um, invertebrates go about their daily life. It actually takes you to a different world. It's quite fascinating. I'm sure Fiona will probably talk more about that. So welcome. Hi. So that was amazing, Jamie. Thanks for that speech. That's like, I'm so excited that there might be a seagrass puppet in our town. Um, look, I'm really excited to be here. You guys, I admire you so much. First of all, I want to say I'm excited to be here for another reason, because I've just left my two young children at home. So it's really exciting for me to come here and talk to people who are actually willing to sit down and listen. <laughs> but I'm also excited because I really love bird people. We're actually quite similar. We both have an amazing passion for um, a natural wonder of our world. For you it's birds and for me it's seagrass. So I'm just going to start by, um, I'm just going to adjust the title of my talk because I was looking at it, I think it could be a little bit more succinct, a little bit more punchy. So I'm just going to do that and I'm just going to do this. Now I know that Chris Hassel did that joke first. No collaboration, just great minds think alike. So, I want to start by saying Ngaji Gurujan and acknowledging the Yarra traditional owners of Roebuck Bay and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So not only are Yaru the perpetual authority on the bay since time began, we're also so lucky that they are our key project partner since the beginning of the Broome Community Seagrass Monitoring Project. So thank you Yaru for your ongoing guidance and direction. Now I'm going to start this talk with a story. This story took place 26 days ago in Broome and it begins at night. It was a dark and stormy night. Okay, I know that's a cliche, but it really was a dark and stormy night for Broome standards. The wind speed for that morning was predicted at a blustery 42 kilometres per hour. And for Broome, it was freezing. It was minus two degrees. Okay, fine, it wasn't minus two degrees, it was 10 degrees, but for broom people, you must understand, that feels like minus two degrees to us. <laughs> Around 4.30 a.m. that night, in the pre-dawn darkness, while the rest of broom was snuggled up fast asleep, some mysterious figures emerged from their homes all around broom. They got into their four-wheel drives and they drove off into the night. What were they doing at that hour? What could be so important to get them out of bed in those arctic conditions? Okay, fine, not arctic, but for broom people, pretty much arctic. The mysterious contingency drove out of town, turned east and then south and suddenly they stopped. The figures got out and they climbed down the shadowy Pindan cliffs and they walked towards the dark sea. Then as the first delicate rays of sun emerged over the horizon, they saw it. The first blades of sea grass. It glowed like emerald jewels in the mud at their feet. And this was the reason for their visit. There they are. But something doesn't make sense. The place these people were is not one of our community projects, three monitoring sites which are closer to town. So, who were these people and what were they doing there? Before I give you the answer to this mystery, let's take a step back and let's look at this delicate little green stuff, this petite little plant that forms vast meadows under the sea. Like this. And like this. And like this. I could do this all day. But let's take a look at what seagrass actually is. Now, 
let me actually start by saying what seagrass is not. <clears throat> seagrass is not the latest interior design furniture trend. You sometimes see seagrass woven chairs or seagrass uh, baskets for sale. Don't worry, they call them seagrass, they're not seagrass, they're nearly always a freshwater reed. Something else that seagrass is not is seaweed. So seagrass has roots and seaweed uh, only has a simple hold fast and their internal structure is completely different and they have a completely different evolutionary history. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, a piece of seagrass poked its head up out of the ocean and said to his mate, Psst, hey Frank, look over there. It's land plants. And Frank said, I know there's land plants there, so what? And the seagrass said, well, Frank, come on. Land plants, what if their land plants are having more fun than us sea plants? I don't want to miss out on fun. So the seagrasses picked themselves up out of the ocean and they went and lived on the land. This is a true story. They became terrestrial plants. Now, around the time of the dinosaurs, the seagrasses decided to return to their roots. See what I did there? So the seagrass was like, Frank, did you catch the game? What? Jeepers, did you see that, Frank? That stegosaurus nearly stomped me. That's it, tell my wife, Frank, I'm moving back to the sea. And the seagrass has migrated back to the sea. Now, This is why they are completely different to seaweed. They have an internal vascular system and they even ha have underwater flowers. That's right, you heard me correctly. They do have underwater flowers, actual flowers under the actual sea water. It's amazing. Can you imagine how happy that makes the mermaid population? <laughs> so that's what seagrass is. Now we're going to have a quick look at why seagrass is important. So we're going to play a game. I'm going to list all the reasons that seagrass is important to humans and to our world. And you try and pick which is the most important. Okay, so listen carefully. Here we go. Number one. Habitat. So it's a habitat for animals including fish, shorebirds, marine mammals, Fiona wests, and benthic invertebrates. And when I say benthic invertebrates, I mean all the critters, the snails, the worms, the starfish, the sea cucumbers, crabs, anemones, things like that, habitat. Number two is biodiversity. There are 40, biodiversity, there are 40 times more animals occurring in the seagrass meadows than on bare sand. Number three, food web support. Seagrass is a foundation of the marine food web. It's a primary producer, so it converts light energy from the sun into um, plant matter, which then feeds the rest of the bay, particularly via the benthic invertebrates, which feed the shorebirds, so food web. Number four is dugong. Dugong eat up to 40 kilograms of seagrass a day. That's the equivalent to 60 iceberg lattices and seagrass is all they eat. So they uproot the whole seagrass plant and they eat the roots, rhizomes, stems, leaves. And when dugong eat seagrass in Rabbit Bay, they leave these amazing trails that we get to see at low tide. And now here's something that you might not know. Continuing on with our popular theme today of poo, dugong poo is really special. Dugong poo has magical qualities. Yeah, dugong poo, magical. Recent studies have shown that dugong could be the seed spreading birds of the sea via their poo. So they've analysed their poo and they've found viable seagrass seeds. So while dugong is relying on seagrass to feed them, seagrass could be relying on dugong to help spread their seeds. And I have to say thank you to one of my Yaru um, country manager friends for making me aware of this research recently. It was an exciting day when I heard the news about dugong poo. I can tell you. So reason number five is turtle. Turtle also eat a lot of seagrass. 
um, they eat up to two kilograms per day. And this guy was out at our DEMCO site during a recent monitoring session. We often see them out there. And did you know that turtles have taught us something recently about seagrass? So scientists were tracking turtles and all these turtles kept visiting this spot in the middle of the ocean in between Australia and Africa. And the scientists are like, why are they going there? There's nothing there. So they took a look. There was a huge subtitle seagrass meadow in that spot and no one had known it was there. The turtles showed us. Number six. Fish and fishing, and if you're a broom local, fish soup and rice. So we've started a hashtag with our project, hashtag love fish, thank seagrass. And that's to help share the message that um, seagrass is really important to our fisheries. It's a breeding ground and nursery for fish and crustaceans. Reason number seven. Now they call um, marine-based carbon sinks blue carbon sinks, and seagrass is one of the most efficient and cost-effective Capture, carbon capture and storage systems that we know of. Seagrass stores carbon, get this, 35 times faster than rainforests. 35 times faster than rainforests. It's extraordinary. So seagrass is really important to the health of our climate. And just down the road, we have a species different to ours, but it's a sobering example of how devastating the loss of seagrass can be in terms of climate harm. So this place, it's just a stone throw from Broome, it's like 18, 19 hours drive. It's a place called Shark Bay. Now a few years ago, Shark Bay suffered a massive heat wave and it killed a large section of its seagrass. And when that seagrass died, it released no less than nine million tonnes of CO2 into our atmosphere. 9 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's a lot of CO2. Now, I don't know why, but in Australia, we don't currently count carbon released from dying seagrass in our official greenhouse gas emissions reporting. But if we did, that Shark Bay seagrass death event would mean that Australia might need to change its figures upwards by more than 20%. 20% of our nation's greenhouse gas emissions from the loss of the Shark Bay seagrass. So you can understand why scientists and the media at the time described the death event as a carbon bomb. So seagrass is powerfully good at storing carbon and seagrass death is incredibly dangerous for our climate. So let's speed this up now. Reason number eight is water quality. So seagrass purifies our water, absorbs nutrients, reduces turbidity and it also absorbs pathogens. When I say pathogens, I mean germs waterborne germs, bacteria, and this is disgusting, but this includes human origin bacteria. So studies have shown that seagrass absorbs those pathogens and makes the water safer for us. And it stops fish getting sick from fish diseases too. So like I always like to say, a seagrass meadow a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> now seagrass also oxygenates the water and of course oxygenated seawater is really good for keeping things in the sea alive. So water quality. It also stabilises sediment, its roots hold everything in place and it helps prevent erosion. And finally, number 10, bioindicator. So here in Broomtown back in 2006-07, traditional owners and local residents were starting to express concern about the bay. There was a decline in some species they were talking about and there was the, the concern over lingvia. This inspired a call locally for a monitoring project to help keep tabs on the health of the bay. Now seagrass is one of the most powerful bioindicator indica species that we have for Rubbock Bay and that means by tracking the health of seagrass over time we can get an ongoing indication of how the health of the whole bay is going. Very handy. And now here's one bonus reason why seagrass is important. Hollywood glamour. So seagrass is glamorous all on its own, clearly. But if you add a film crew to seagrass, voila, you have an A-grade Hollywood candidate right here in our bay. And someone has just added a film crew to our seagrass. He's a brilliant local film director called Gary Hamaguchi and he's currently shooting a documentary funded by Screen Australia featuring Yarrow people and the seagrass of Roback Bay. 
It's going to be screened nationally next year and it's going to be awesome. So this is testament to the fact that this humble little species of marine grass has a huge potential to fascinate the masses. So out of all these reasons, and I've put them all here, which do you think is the number one reason seagrass is important? You can keep your answers in your mind and I'll tell you the answer. You ready? Okay. The number one reason seagrass is important is, okay, fine, I don't know. But the fact is that different reasons are important to different people and different communities. So your community, my bird loving friends, you might feel that the most important reason is the ways that seagrass supports shorebirds by supporting the bird's food source and by keeping its home healthy. So maybe these ones. But the take home here is that seagrass is very important to our world, to the creatures in, us, in it and to us as humans. So we've learnt that nearly everything about seagrass is awesome. But there is one thing about seagrass that is not awesome. Seagrass is dying out and it's fast taking these things with it. Now around the world, seagrass meadows are disappearing due to coastal development, physical destruction, dredging, pollution, sewerage, coastal runoff, increased nutrients impacting on water quality and causing the growth of smothering algae and epiphytes. And also locally, of course, lingbia. So in Roebuck Bay, we've had these large lingbia blooms that you've heard about this morning. And lingbia is, of course, a cyanobacteria, and it forms these dense mats. And it can smother the seagrass, preventing light from reaching it and killing the plant. Now, the world loses a seagrass meadow the size of a soccer field every half hour. A soccer field every half hour. So there's a soccer field. Now, I've got to say, the scientists that um, produced this statistic were obviously European or something. If they'd been as culturally sophisticated as we Australians, they would have obviously used the MCG as their unit of measure. But we've got the soccer field here. So by the time I walk down from here, it'll be gone. That's why the film director I just mentioned has entitled his documentary Saving Seagrass because we are losing it globally at a terrifying rate. So that's depressing, but let's change the subject. What's more positive is that here in Roebuck Bay, we have a wonderful community run seagrass monitoring project involving amazing collaborations between traditional owners, community groups, um, government and industry. And at its heart and soul is the rock star volunteers who give their time, energy, skills and experience to keeping track of the health of our seagrass. And after nearly 12 years, it is one of the longest running community seagrass monitoring projects in Australia. And it also has the best looking volunteers in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey Connie. Hey, hey Grace, who else is here? Hey Candy, hey Candy. You all know it. So how do we do it? Um, community volunteers meet regularly at low tide down at Roebuck Bay at one of our three sites. Town Beach, over at Demco and over at the port. And then the most important part happens. <laughs> we eat freshly baked muffins and we drink freshly brewed excellent coffee. And that's the most important part. And then we follow the GPS out into the bay and we monitor the health of the seagrass ecosystem. We get right down and we record everything, including the animals that we see in our quadrants um, and the coverage of the two seagrass species we've got in the bay. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Holophila ovalis and hello, Jewel, uni nervous, otherwise known locally as the round one and the straight one. <laughs> and we follow the standardised methodology of Seagrass Watch, a global scientific seagrass assessment and monitoring program. And then we walk back in 
<laughs> and we eat more muffins and we drink more excellent coffee. The data is sent to see, uh, scientists at Seagrass Watch for quality assessment and control and analysis. And the information is made available to our local coastal managers so that they can make decisions about the bay with more confidence. And this project is remarkable because as well as being so important, it is also so much fun. It is a really enjoyable and social experience. It's fascinating and people love it. If you want to join our project as a, as a volunteer, my response would be, oh, I'd have to think about it, yes. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Um, just get in touch. You can find us on social media, hashtag broom seagrass, or get in touch via Environs Kimberley. So more than a decade of muffins, more than a decade of valuable data collected, how is our bay faring? Well, I'm very happy to report that while the health of our seagrass has gone up and down and up again over the duration of our project, as of last analysis, it's in reasonably healthy condition. Well done, Brew. And if you want a detailed breakdown of all the science, there's a comprehensive report on the first 10 years of the project available on the Seagrass Watch website and also a 20-page report card available on the Environs Kimberley website. So time's nearly up. I want to return to our mystery story. Who were those people? What were they doing? And where were they? So the place was Black Ledge. And apart from being one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life, it is also a place which happens to be inside the boundary of the new Yarrow Nugulagan Roebuck Bay Marine Park, and that's a clue. And now here are the people. Boom. Some very cool people in this photo. And don't you reckon they look like some kind of rock album cover? <laughs> so here we have two Nyambaburiyaru country managers a Seagrass Watch lead scientist, a DBC, a Marine Park coordinator and Yaru Ranger, and an Environs Kimberley Marine ecologist. What a team. And there was someone else there, that was me. I wasn't in the photo, I was taking the photo, so I'll just add myself. <laughs> there you go. Now all these people were at Black Ledge for a historic recce and meeting on Yaru Sea Country at low tide to assess that site as a potential fourth monitoring site. This is so exciting. A fourth monitoring site for our project and a fourth monitoring site situated within the marine park waters. It was the power of our humble little plant, seagrass, that brought these people to that site on that morning. And the discussions on country were so exciting and comprehensive, spanning marine park management needs um, and inventories, reviews of cultural and scientific information on seagrass patterns, the need for sentinel sites and ground truthing, um, feeding into turtle and dugong management plans and a range of other site selection considerations, so logistics, access, tides and um, capacity, and the methodology parameters, which is why the lead scientist from Seagrass Watch was in attendance. So such is the strength and value of our community group's long-term data set that the Seagrass methodology and data is now one of the most valuable tools available to coastal managers to look after Roebuck Bay and to look after the new marine park and, most important, to look after the home of the shorebirds that you love. So this is the exciting new chapter of the Broome Community Seagrass Monitoring Project and to sum up, Seagrass is awesome, our broom community is awesome, and all that muffin eating has totally paid off. <laughs> Gully and thank you.